happy belated Remembrance Day, Tony. Thank you, Michael. And it's uh, still Veterans slash Remembrance Day here uh, on this side of the planet. So yep. still celebrating. Uh, how are you? I'm doing I'm doing very well. Yeah, we actually did. Um, uh, we hosted a Remembrance Day service um, at the pl my place where I work yesterday. And um, I was approached a few weeks ago, asked if I would say a few words um, at the service because I, I do that on Anzac Day as well. Said, yeah, yeah, no, no problem. And about 200 people turned up. So <laughs> nice. It's all, yeah. it's all those analog toys fans that don't tell you they watch the show. <laughs> um, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, everybody, we have a very, very, very special guest uh, for this particular episode of War Stories. Longtime in person friend and supporter of both our channels, mm -hmm. um, and just an all around knowledgeable powerhouse of pop culture. My good friend, Master Sun 42, he's here. Let me bring him on and put him in the, the hot seat. There you are, sir. Oh, my goodness. I'm here. You're I started here. to have my chair backwards and then turn around dramatically. But <laughs> <laughs> He came on the show and pulled a Palpatine. It was crazy. <laughs> uh, well, how are you, man? I am good. It's a good day. Mm -hmm. um, Got off work early just to come back here and get ready for this on our Veterans Day. Well, I, I am so pleased that you're here. Um, I believe, I don't want to speak for Tony, but I believe he's also pleased that you're here. He could hate I your hands. I don't know. So, <laughs> Tony, you've also had the pleasure of meeting Master Sun 42 in person during Icon Con. So we're all in-person friends. Yeah, yeah. We've, um, we've had a few man hugs, hey, Clemens? Yep, a couple. I, I think he went from my butt a little bit, a little reach. But it was yeah. right. Can you blame him, though? Mm -hmm. yeah. I've got a thing for airport, to you know. <laughs> well, today, everybody, uh, this was recommended by our good friend, Master Sun 42, about a month ago. Uh, and it's the 1988 film Bat 21, based on a true story starring Gene Hackman and Danny Glover. Um, would anybody here now that we have I used to I'd have to say Tony, would you like to? But now I got a group, so it's like, would anybody here uh, like to set up the premise for the movie before, as we start, or do you want anybody want me to do that? It's fine, and then you keep me honest or whatever. I can do it. You want to do it? Or, oh, by all means, the table is easy. Great. So there's two parts. There's the movie, and then there's the real events. And <laughs> And I'll try to fill in the blanks with the real events when they're applicable. But for the movie's sake, basically, you have this uh, old guy, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, who is a, a navigator on an EB-66 is the name of the aircraft, electronic warfare. So they're jamming and all kind of stuff. Um, basically, the aircraft gets shot down. He ejects only one to make it. And he lands behind enemy lines. And so the movie is all about them trying to rescue him over the course of, I believe it was 11 days of trying to pick him up and all the events that happened for the movie. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. In fact, I would have said it worse. Um, <laughs> Gene Hackman would go on to uh, do this movie again with Owen Wilson called Behind Enemy Lines, where Owen Wilson plays the doctor. It's not the same story. Uh, but it is, in some ways, I, I was like, am I going to let him go with this? Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, Tony, had you ever seen this movie before? Yes. I, I saw this movie um, when it first came out on home video. Like, in, in in that period of my life, you know, the the second half of the 1980s and, you know, first few years of the 1990s, I was obsessed with all of these kinds of films. Mm -hmm. Um to the point where I even found myself the other day on a streaming service watching Michael Dudikoff's Platoon Leader from Canon. Um, that is not one I recommend that we do on War Stories. Um, but yes, I, I, I saw this when it first came out on home video. Mm -hmm. um, so when it, it got suggested for the show, I thought, I know I've watched this film. I had a, a rough idea of what, the premise was but it was that long ago it was like i don't 
remember the actual events, but in the back of my mind, I was like, I just remember that I really like this film. Yeah. Um, so being able to to revisit it um, has been quite the pleasure. And um, to anyone in the chat who hasn't seen it, it's actually available on YouTube. The, the whole movie It's not very good quality, um, but it is available on YouTube. Mm -hmm. so. Um, I uh, bought the Kino Lorber Blu-ray uh, for this episode. Um, I, uh, I had seen the movie way back in the day. I don't remember if it was like a TV broadcast or if it was a rental. I don't remember, honestly. It was so long ago that I might as well have not seen it. So I made sure to watch it in nice high definition, upscale to 4K. And, uh, you know, it, before we get into the actual details of the film, I just want to say sentimentally i guess even though this movie wasn't one i grew up with in a sense it was really nice to see a movie it always settles me into my seat just a little more snugly when you can immediately tell that everything you're about to see in a movie is all in camera like yep. i don't know what it is there's something about seeing a film from back in the mid to late 80s early you know an early 90s that cusp period there like 87 to 92 where everything's still pretty much in camera and they're just trying to tell good stories. I even made sure to watch the trailer afterwards on the Blu-ray because the trailer was one of those ones that still had the voice of God kind of thing. Where, <laughs> oh, so it was so good. He, you know, he's an expert on, you know, missile defense systems, and blah, blah, blah. He's just been shot down behind enemy lines. And I was like, Oh, it's so good. Um, all right. So before we get started, um, we have two veterans uh, on the chat, or on the chat. We have two veterans in the show tonight, everybody. There I am. We almost only had one veteran in the show, but we've... we've <laughs> uh, Clemens we just went behind enemy lines for a moment. <laughs> we, have, we have Tony, of course, and you know his background as uh, SAS, British SAS. But Master Son, I believe you wanted to give us a little bit of your background from your military days as well. Hello? Can you hear me? Can, can, I, can you hear me? <laughs> it's going to be a great show, everybody. <laughs> well, Master Son is just uh, sorting that out. I just would, you know, being Veterans Day, I would just like to take a moment to... Uh, Anyone who's either in the live chat now or watching this on a on a later replay, um, if you are a veteran, I would like to thank you for your service and uh, happy Veterans Day, everyone. Absolutely. Hey, can you hear me, Master Son? Oh, he, he's gone. He'll be back. He'll be back. All right. Bird Dog, is that you, Bird Dog? <laughs> hey, Bird Dog. Hey, Bird Dog. I gotta, I gotta work on. Uh, I don't. I've never done a Gene Hackman impression, so um, I'm gonna have to work on that. Except maybe probably lines from Superman. I bet you I've done a lot of Superman before. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, Gene Hackman's not an impression you see many people do very often. Yeah, even though he has a very distinct, you know, voice and everything like that. Are you back? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you? I have. Oh, I almost heard you, but now you're gone again. It's, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. 30 minutes of system checks before we start. You know, this is Murphy's Law, this isn't is it? How it works. <laughs> this is how it works. I believe the best in. The plan never survived the first contact with the enemy. So mm -hmm. we're, we're going to get it worked out, everyone. We, everything was working just fine. Um, yeah, Danny Boy calling broadsword. Danny Boy calling broadsword. <laughs> um, I love Jason's comment. I can't hear you. The live stream brought, brought to you by the letter huh and the number what? <laughs> hey, I come on, say something, say something. Nope. Okay. I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, I don't think he can hear us, though. <laughs> Just keep talking. I'm thinking you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. So, here's what we're going to I like all, all my audio. And I talk about even. military service. 
All right, I'm going to reboot my computer. Okay. And come back. All right. Don't finish without me. Okay. We got this. We got this. All right. All right. So we're going to just start the, the movie discussion uh, while he's working that out. So um, I will remove him from uh, the thing and then I will kick him from the studio. All right. All right. Here we go. So the thing that, that I want to bring up first is very little to do with the plot. It's more about what I just talked about, about the way they used to make movies. And mm -hmm. Tony, I don't know if you picked up on this, but when, we, when, when the movie opens and it opens on a golf course with yep. Gene Hackman and one of his uh, comrades just having a game of golf um, as he plays the real life character of uh, Lieutenant Colonel um, he's got a weird sp spelled last name. I can't remember. It's, it's... Hamilton. Uh, I Lieutenant Colonel I Seal Hamilton. Everyone called him Ham. Um, yeah, right. for Hamilton, yeah. That'll be helpful, actually, to just call him. Yep. Um, there is this shot at the beginning as they are talking about their golf game. Mm -hmm. it, it never cuts, and this massive, you know, uh, personnel helicopter just drops down behind them in the same shot while they're doing the whole scene. And it's yep. it, the shot ends up being over two minutes long, which is a long time in movie making terms. What I've done is I have sped it up by 500% and, and pulled the audio out just to kind of give you guys an impression of, of what this shot looked like in the opening scene. Try and imagine that this shot is actually two and a half minutes long. So this, this is the, one of the opening shots of the film. I mean, unbelievable. Are you back? I'm back. Yeah. Yes. Had to go to old faithful headphones. See, this is this is how you don't get invited back. No, no. This is this <laughs> is a very typical issue. You know how many times I've had a, a dropout or something, or Tony's camera will just shut off. I mean, <laughs> it happens, man. It's it's technological yeah. entropy. Fortunately, uh, we are now at a point where I've talked about my filmmaking bruja. Uh, with that opening shot. Before we get started, I know you wanted to talk about your military credentials, uh, Master Sun. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about that and we'll jump into the plot of the movie. So, you know, just since you have so many people on your channel who 100% believe every single thing you do, I figured just, just so there's no discussion, I was going to, you know, and I know you have some pictures that we're going to throw up there just to let everybody know I am somewhat legit. Um, that, that, look at look look at that sexy. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Boy, you can't you can't just make that up. Everybody can't get one of those. Yeah. <laughs> but that's me. That was uh, my, one of my official pictures uh, for an award or something. But that's like an official picture that you get. Mm -hmm. Um I was uh, 13 Bravo, which is an air battle manager. So I flew on board AWACS. I flew in the back seat of uh, F-15s for um, did some ground uh, duties. That right there is uh, that's a picture of me getting my air medal uh -huh. after uh, September 11th for uh, flying. Wow. Um, so I was probably back in country for like a, a week and a half, two weeks. And they're like, Hey, we got a war ceremony. So you got to come and wow. get your, get your first medal. So that's my squadron commander on the left. Uh -huh. And uh, that is uh, a couple of us who, uh, you know, were, were there long enough to get, get the medal. So wow, that was about 50 pounds ago. Oh, I, <laughs> I wasn't counting. <laughs> Um, I mean, besides, I mean, low angles, they can and, and cannot be flattering depending on what you're doing. So, yep. um, but yeah, yeah, you're, this is, this is, we now have two military veterans here and basically just 
one guy that's like that military historian that's like, so what'd you guys do when you were on the hill with the thing? Um, all right. Uh, so let's jump into the film. Oh, Brian Dillingham has a super chat. He says, go Air Force and SAS. Thank hey. you. Appreciate that. Um, all right. We are now in the movie, everyone. We are, we are in the film. So uh, he gets called off the golf course. And he's told that he has to report to, you know, the command center because they have to talk about this potential, what, counteroffensive that the Vietnamese are planning. Yes. And, um, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, you're, you're good. Okay. And um, as they're looking over the map and everything, Gene Hackman's character, Ham, says, why don't we go in there and try and map out their, their missile strength? Why don't we go over there and I'll take my boys and we'll – try and map out where they are and what their strength is and what their capabilities are. And they're like, all right. So they go over there. Now, this is my first question for Master Sun. So I did a little reading on the history as well. And I could have this wrong, but in the movie, the airplane has a crew of what appears to be six people. Yes. In the actual event, it was a crew of three, right? Not okay. So I ran into the same trap. It was okay. actually a crew of six. Uh -huh. That particular plane is based off of a, a B sixty six, mm -hmm. which generally had a crew of three. And where the rest of the people were, that's where like uh, bombs and equipment went. So whenever they converted it to an electronic warfare, they stripped all that out, added more seats and consoles. Oh, okay. So in the actual incident, it would have been a crew of six. It was a it was a crew of six, and uh, when they ejected, five were killed. Wow! So he was the only one to get out of there. Yeah. So they're 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 over the area. They they basically kick the hornet's nest. They the the Vietnamese start sending up missiles, and they're tracking them and their positions and and everything like that. And one of the missiles makes a home run and hits the plane. And yeah. this is where uh, I'll show you a brief sequence of clips. For everybody watching, um, you're going to see a lot of disjointed clips all in an assembly because this movie is a, it's a slow boil in a good way. I don't mean the movie's slow. I mean the events. While the plot itself is very straightforward, a lot of things that we're describing, we don't want to be stopping for seven-second clips and then jumping back and then jumping back in. So I'm going to kind of show you some sequences throughout the course of this episode of War Stories, and then we'll discuss the whole the whole arc. So here we go. This is this is a uh, the bailout sequence. Identify yourself. Not two one. I'm the parachute above you. One o'clock. He bails out and he's got his radio and his, his sidearm and everything on him. And he I looked up the guy and, and I tried to do my homework because I found out that Master Son was doing a lot of homework. I don't <laughs> so I went and did some homework. This guy was trained in a, a certain amount of jungle survival training before. Mm -hmm. This, this incident. So he's kind of, he's got skills. He's not like a, uh, you know, fish out of water kind of scenario, but he's never been on the battlefield before in this way. He's never yes. been on the ground. So he bails out and true to his procedure, the first thing he does is he contacts the air rescue uh, spotter, which that was news to me. Like when I was watching this, I was like, oh, I was like, that makes sense, but I never considered it. I never considered that they had airplanes patrolling for, for, for that I, I you know it totally made sense but you know you just think that a guy lands gets on the radio and then it goes back to base and then helicopters show up you don't yeah. think there's yeah. yeah yeah so what were you guys thinking about the quality of the movie at this point as far as like the filmmaking the storytelling the pace well it, it, it's that very traditional uh, filmmaking from that kind of period what 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 really struck me at that moment i'm like he's he's just he's flying a cessna like <laughs> you know i'm I, i'm i'm no airplane expert 
but that doesn't even look like a military plan. And all of a sudden, and, and it's really good to revisit a, a film all these years later. It's like this is a, a a piece of war history that you know they don't touch on very often. To to your point, Michael, you know it, it made sense to you that they had these you know um, air rescue spotter planes flying around. Mm -hmm. But it's but it's never occurred to you before because it's not something that really gets highlighted very often. So um, yeah, yeah. And and I was looking closely at the plane, and I didn't I didn't have time to go look it up. But it was obviously it's a it's a twin boom tail plane with a rear prop on it as well, yeah. it's a front and a rear one. And it's it, a ov ten. It's a B ten. Ov ten. Ov ten. So this would have is this an accurate uh, airframe? That is the airplane that they were using. Wow. Okay. See. Yeah. It, Check that box. I mean, that's <laughs> good. Um, then they quickly establish the relationship between Bird Dog, which is Danny Glover's call sign, and Bat Twenty One, which is Gene Hackman Ham, the Lieutenant Colonel Ham. This part was probably this was the part where I sat up in my seat and kind of leaned forward and started, you know, because. The dialogue was really strong and they weren't leaving the audience behind, but they weren't treating us like we were stupid, which I thought was nice. Bet you one, get out of that paddy. Who just did us out? Head north to the tree line. Repeat, head north to the tree line. Negative, I want to wait for the choppers. Negative. I'm the lifeguard, you're the drowning man. If you relax, I can bring you to shore. If you fight me, then I'll have to slap you around. I love the way they sur they summarize that. He's like, you're the drowning man and I'm the lifeguard. So yeah. if you decide you're not going to do what I say, which is get to the tree line, I'm I'm going to do what I have to do. Right? My job is to get you home safe. Um, a, a very different kind of um, military relationship dynamic in the field than I'd ever seen documented on film before. I was like, oh, this is actually really yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I will tell you, so this part up until this part, they're kind of accurate with what really happened. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I'll keep going back and forth between what really happened, what didn't. So mm -hmm. he, he did eject. Mm -hmm. It was landing over. It was he got shot down by an SA-2, which is the wow. missile that shot him. Uh, but the another SA-2 hit before anybody else can eject and disintegrate the aircraft. Uh -huh. When he was floating down. He was seen by an OV-10 who was literally under him. Uh, his guy name was uh, C Captain Ike, I-C-K-E, who saw him. Now, here's the part of the movie which I, I go, this is acceptable. Normally, if you're telling me a story that's based off of real events, mm -hmm. I kind of think that the sex and the race of the person should mm -hmm. be the same as what you're showing me on screen. Okay. okay. Yep. All right. Unless it's like a cartoon, you know, something fictional or something like that, I get. It. Yeah. So for historical stuff, yes. you don't want you don't want to see Richard the Lionheart played by anything other than some Anglo Norman. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. So Captain Clark in this case is actually a white guy. Uh -huh. However, it's assessed that Danny Glover's character is based off of three different people. Mm. One of them was a black guy, so mm -hmm. I went mm, acceptable. And plus, is Danny Glover? Mm -hmm. You can't go wrong there. Danny Glover in his prime. No, yes, like, yeah. yes, yeah. So yeah. that all that scenario of them, he landed in a draw. The only thing that was different was it was overcast. Yep. So they didn't. The NBA couldn't see him come down, but he landed out in the open on his radio, you know, beeping and all that stuff and talking. And he was like, all right, come get me. And they were like, mm, we can't right now. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> so, so for everybody watching the way that I would describe the, the, the philosophy they took with this, this film was kind of like with the great escape in Memphis bell, where they said, we've got a lot of events that happened over an 11 day period. We're going to have to compress some of this down for time. And that means we're going to have to put certain personalities into one character. Yep. So that's kind of what that, that's not kind of they literally did that. So they took three different people and made Danny Glover, all three of those people at the same time. So you're going to see a lot of different things happen. Um, and I'm totally I'm totally OK with that. It's not like 
John Wayne playing Genghis Khan. <laughs> <laughs> that would never happen. Where it's, <laughs> where the, the verisimilitude is just broken. Where it's just like I can't, I can't get there. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, he, he, he starts getting mortared. And they start lobbing mortars into the rice paddy, and he's like, "Oh, Danny Glover's right." I better get to the tree line. <laughs> so he starts hoofing it to the tree line. And then he explains to him, after he gets in the tree line, he explains to him what's going to happen. He's like, he's still on the radio with him. Repeat, Jolly Grease will pick you up in the morning. There will be no pickup today. Copy Ben 21. I copy, Bird Dog. Well, we pulled our share of pilots out of there, but never a 53-year-old Lieutenant Colonel. <laughs> 53-year-old Lieutenant Colonel. That's right. Well, he's an electronics countermeasure expert. I'm told that the communists will have a dossier on him that thick. So not only is this man um, somebody who's never been in the, in the actual physical battlefield on the ground before, but he's also really, really, really important to both sides. They, the, the, the Viet Cong want this guy really badly if they can get him. Uh, and so his his previous job was with the 571st missile squadron, ballistic missile, ICBMs. Yeah. So when they talk about what he knew, he had a top secret clearance. He worked in our nuclear missile stuff before he went back to become a do his duty as a navigator. He was their commander. So I'm sure that's what they're alluding to about the information he knows. Because if you'd have been captured and they would have figured out who he was, he'd have been in Hanoi. And then probably pulled up to the Russians would have came down and had a conversation with them. Wow. Yeah. Well, this is one of those types of prisoners that were, when they know there's the potential to capture this guy, somebody in the Viet Cong is going, Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So then we, we see uh, what we just saw um, everybody was, he said, the, the zone is too hot. We can't pick you up today. You're going to have to. We have also got evac going on. With, we're, we're all tied up in another area with all of our equipment. So we're going to pick you up tomorrow. So you got to spend the night. So he spends kind of a dicey night um, in the jungle. And what you just saw from the, uh, the conversation in the Jeep was that his commanding officer was telling him, this guy's really important and we want to keep him plugged in like we want we want to know where he is so you're going to go back tonight and just keep tabs on him just mm -hmm. make sure he's okay and then come back and he's like well can't the other guy do it <laughs> he's like no you're gonna do it and he's like oh everybody i believe this was either one year after or the same year as lethal weapon i think lethal weapon was 87 or, not, or was it 87 uh, yeah it was one year after yeah um i would like to point out that the pastiche of Danny Glover's characters into one character in this film includes a guy who historically um, was two weeks from being able to leave Vietnam and go home and then mm -hmm. ended up getting uh, shot down. That's after Danny Glover already played a guy two weeks from retirement in Lethal Weapon. <laughs> so there's kind of a, you know, was it, was he two weeks from retirement in, in the first one? He was, he was close. I think I can't remember if it was maybe that or the second one, but he was turning 50 yeah. in, in the first. Yeah. One, so he was, yeah. Um, but it, it, it's an interesting trope that I know Danny Glover as the lethal weapon guy who's two weeks from retirement. So when they said when they're in the Jeep and he looks at the guy and he says, come on, man, he's like, I'm, I'm two weeks from being able to, you know, get a rest or whatever and kind of bounce out. And he's like, no, you're, you're the one going back in there tonight. You're going back in there. I need you. Oh, uh, it gave me a little chuckle. So, <laughs> also, it's weird, everybody. In this film, Danny Glover is um, playing a 35-year-old guy. He obviously still looks very young and is probably around that age, maybe just a little older. And in *Lethal Weapon*, he was playing a 50-year-old the year prior, and they grayed up his hair a little yep, bit. Yep. Pretty funny stuff to see how Hollywood shifts things around like that. Um, okay. I would give anything for Danny Glover's build in his prime. The man looks amazing. Uh, all right, so here's the night visit sequence. Appreciate you dropping by, Bird Dog. 
That's what I'm here for. Charlie walked by my hole about an hour ago. How many? Ten or twelve. Seems to be quiet now. I feel like a real jerk. I'm the big expert on this deal, and I get a shot down. The revelation is that not only are there a lot of soldiers in the area, and he's having very near misses with them in the dark underneath the, the palm fronds and all that kind of stuff, but they're listening to all the radio chatter trying to triangulate where this guy is. They're already on top of it. They're already listening. And they're taking latitudes and longitudes and coordinates and all kinds of stuff. Um, at this point, I thought the tension was pretty high in the movie because one sequence I couldn't show you guys because of copyright and all that stuff because it'd be too long. He realizes that as he's pulling all this stuff together, when he hears them coming and he gets up underneath the, the foliage, his, his compass ended up just being left right at his foot, but it's just outside the shadow. So he had to figure out how to carefully put a leaf over the compass. But before they all show up, he's trying to figure out where he is on the map. Again, he's got jungle survival training. He's not, he's not a stupid person who's out of water. He's not like, it's, it's, this isn't like one of those situations, everyone, where like the Stars and Stripes journalist or something that shows up that doesn't yeah. know anything about anything. He's, he's a smart dude, but for the, for, for the purposes of our discussion, I wanted to ask both of you guys, would he have had a flashlight out looking at that map in the situation he was in, or was that for the benefit of the audience? So he could have a flashlight. It would have a red lens on it. Uh -huh. Red doesn't travel as far at night. Mm -hmm. You tend to do all that figuring out stuff during the day uh -huh. um, and not necessarily at night. At night, you're in a hole and you're trying just to stay there and not be seen because right. you don't know who's 15 feet from you. If you can't see them because it's yeah. the jungles of Vietnam. There's no street lights. You right. Know? So, uh, you know, that's a little Hollywood ish. Mm -hmm. I, I, if it was me, yeah. I would be deep undercover praying to every God I have ever heard of <laughs> asking for my mommy and a few other things. So I would be making some serious deals in my head with things I will do. If you get me up out of this one. What do you think, Tony? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with Clemens because uh, I, I, I can see what he's he's doing there with, with the you know he's trying to, um, he's try, obviously trying to figure out his location. To be able to do that, you need to be able to you know reference your map and then look at various landmarks. You can't see anything in the jungle at night, mm -hmm. anything at all. And no, you you would not be giving your position away. Um, with a flashlight, you know, it looks good on on, on camera, I, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know exactly how it works in the United States military, Clemens. So fill in the, the blanks for me a little bit here. But um, certainly in, in the United Kingdom, we have two um, specialist courses called, one's called Escape and Evasion, mm -hmm. um, which is what this character, Gene Hackman's character is doing at the moment. He's trying to escape and evade the enemy. Um, and then resistance to interrogation, which is how you conduct yourself um, following capture. The only people in the British military who even at, at, uh, go on these courses are military personnel who may find themselves behind enemy lines. So the special forces and pilots, and that's it. Like no one else does these courses. Um, and it's always very interesting you know the special forces guys will will, will approach it a, a slightly different way but um he, he would i imagine he would have had extensive training he may not have had to put it into practice before but he would have had extensive training so um <clears throat> i i would like clemens if if you have the uh, yeah. inclination to explain to us some of the equipment because he's only you know he's got his flight suit and a small vest but he's got some really really essential equipment which you know plays a major part in in this film um he knows what all of that equipment's for he knows how to use it when he needs to use it um so what kind of stuff is he carrying there so you would ask me and i actually have that in my notes i'm gonna find it as i'm talking um a couple of things <laughs> so a couple of things yes he is correct on the training um the resistance training kind of developed after vietnam because of all the people who were captured in vietnam 
So yep. they had to start putting this together, this course to just like you said, to, to tell you how to conduct uh, for the training, for the survival training and all that. We do all everybody who's air crew. You have to do your survival training and then you get an annual refresher. And if right before you deploy to some location, they give you another one. Mm -hmm. So on that training, it depends on what your job is. There's different types. So special forces get a different training than what I got because their information that they would get is different from mine. I got it as standard air crew training, but then some of us got called to, we'll call it advanced beatings. And depending on what your knowledge is, you have to go to an additional four or five extra days to learn some stuff. And, but yeah, you've got all that, all that training. So back to his question, I got to find it, but from what I remember, because I can't find it. So he has his vest. He had two survival radios with him. Um, now we have one. Back in the day, they had two because you had a beacon, I believe, on the one radio. And the other one was the one to talk. And you'd have your several batteries to go with it. But, you, I mean, you just wouldn't have that. Um, canteens, map, compass, um, what else did he have? Um, a flashlight. I mean, that that vest of stuff, you have a little small med kit in there, um, some iodine, some uh, water purification. So back then it was iodine tablets, mm -hmm. which you yep. have so that you can get water, um, which is funny because in real life, I'm trying to figure out what exactly happened because he was he was very dehydrated. Um, he ran out of water, so he was never able to refill his canteen. But yeah, that, that several things. And that's your your Air Force survival vest, which goes on under your flight your flight suit on with no patches, no name tag, no nothing. You put your uh, flight vest on, then you put all your uh, ejection gear on. You know, you got your harness and all that stuff. So then you go into the aircraft, you sit down, you strap into the aircraft. So now when the seat goes out, you pull your seat kit out with you and it has some additional stuff in it. Good deal. Uh, Scott Knudsen, thank you for the super chat. He says, always love me some war stories. And thank you very much for the kind super Ooh, chat. 20 yeah. bucks. <laughs> uh, all right. So we are now at the point in the film where he wakes up the next day he's had a nice chat with danny glover that night you know they've, they've talked a little bit he checked up on him the next morning he wakes up tries to get his bearings and he sees a convoy of vietnamese soldiers and equipment coming down the road danny glover bird dog shows back up to check on him see how he's doing and he's already called into him saying hey there's movement over here we got stuff going on and he decides that what he wants to do is call in the shots for an, a, a strafing run, a bombing run on this convoy. Um, and so this little moment occurs, not a little moment, it's a big moment. Let's put some hits on these guys. I got a good visual, I'll call them. You sure? You're pretty close to the action, you might get nicked. Nice quarterback. Maybe we ought to leave here for the second half. Negative. I've seen enough. He's real rattled by what he's seen because after they do two strafing runs, I had to cut it down to one. After they do two strafing runs, he's watching through his scope and he's seeing all of the the carnage from the attack. And he's kind of like, ugh, I've, I've never been this close to this. I don't, uh, ugh. you know, he's, he kind of kind of freaks a little bit. So that was 100% Hollywood. Yeah. Um, we would never do that because we'll mess around and call it on ourselves. Because <laughs> even now with with the, the systems that we had, we've actually had people call it on themselves because they read it backwards because mm -hmm. they're not trained to do that. That takes specific training. So that 
did happen where they did do support. They were doing it all day and all night around him, and mm -hmm. it would have been done by one of the OV-10, the fact the forward air controllers flying over above. Gotcha. So he wouldn't have been calling it in there. No. What they're doing is they're trying to, for the Hollywood <clears throat> uh, script, and I understand a little bit why, but you're right. It's starting to push the boundaries a little bit where they're trying to give the main character central to the plot something to do. Yep. He's, yep. He's, he's hanging out in the jungle just waiting. Yeah. yeah. And he may have seen some stuff that is quite possible for him to, because they were, a lot of the stuff was really close to him. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that the military didn't know is two days before he got shot down. They launched the North Vietnamese launched the largest offensive in the whole war. Uh -huh. And so it was 30,000 troops heading down and he dropped right in front of them, like 10, a couple miles in front of their front lines as they're pushing. So, you know how he said there was no other uh, rescue for that night. Mm -hmm. Actually they tried during the day, everybody was getting tore up. Planes was getting lit up. Um, several planes limped back home. It right. was just so heavy because they had so much artillery. Yeah, that they did. But you are one hundred percent correct. You would this movie would be very boring of just showing this guy in a hole. Oh, move over here. I'm in another hole. Move but over it, here. It, 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 <laughs> this is right near the end of the war, isn't it? So it this is. would be not too long prior to you know the fall of Saigon. And yep. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of North Vietnamese uh, enemy activity going on. And this is when we pulled, we were pulling troops out. So we didn't have nowhere near the number of troops and air support. So when all those aircraft were getting damaged, that's significant because there's not a lot of replacement for all those. Right. Yeah, it would be, it would be really funny if this was such a super accurate film that they hired Gene Hackman to be in a movie where he sat under, you know, a, a palmy, you know, jungle leaf thing for the whole movie. <laughs> And then they gave him an Oscar for it. Like that would have been like the, the just great. Um, he like, and he was paid like thirty million dollars for this role, <laughs> right? Um, Tony, I wanted to ask you what when you when you were in the service and you, I'm sure at some point had to um, not necessarily escort, but interact with or be in a combat zone with people who typically weren't on the ground in the combat zone what what did you guys do like like how did you receive or you know you know what i'm trying to say like how did you guys handle that individual or what did you think or you know that kind of thing well i suppose probably the best example of this is when i was a close personal protection officer to a, a, a u.s army major general mm -hmm. um, major general mike jones and at the time, so he was he he was an experienced guy. I'm not I'm not saying he wasn't, um, but just the the fact that he was a, a, a two star general. You don't normally kind of see yourself on the not that it, the conflict in Iraq didn't exactly have a front line, so to speak. But um, uh, this guy was the head of the civilian police assistance training team. So the organisation that he was in charge of was actually made up of lots of different law enforcement officers from all across the United States. Um, so he didn't have like a military unit to take him around to different locations, which is how me as a British guy ended up as part of this security company becoming a, a close personal protection officer to him. And we were visiting a construction site where they were building a new police station. And much like where Gene Hackman, um, when he first lands in the paddy and he wants to, to stay there and Bird Dog's like, no, 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 you've, you've got to go. Um, they start firing mortars and he's out in the open. That actually happened to us when we were visiting this uh, this construction site. So we we had flown in by Black Hawk, then got picked up um, by an escort team in Humvees, driven out to the location. And m most of the time, uh, the, the the general was very much you know he he was focused on what he was doing. He was a very very um, proficient military man at what he was doing. Um. And there was like an, a, an unspoken kind of agreement between us that he knew what our job was and that we knew how to do it. And we actually had very, very little interaction with him. It was just, you know, he, normally his aide would tell us, you know, hey, 
the general's going here tomorrow. So we would figure out the route and what time we're going to leave and what equipment we're going to take and all this stuff. On this particular day, when uh, we come under a mortar attack, all of a sudden, we're now in charge of that general. Um, and you have to grab him by the back of the body armor, literally bend him over. And I, I ran um, at this Humvee with him bent over. Uh, I literally just threw him headfirst into the, into the back of the Humvee. And it was, you know, these roles had been completely reversed. And the general was just like, you do your job. Let's let's get us the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a, 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 a lieutenant colonel like this guy, you know, that, that's a very, very high rank in the military. It's, um, you know, it's just shy of, you know, then you've got colonel and then you've got general. Um, it's very, very high up. Um, he would have been in the military a long time, a lot of experience. Um, yeah, I, I, it's fun. what watching this film and seeing the dynamic between uh, Danny Glover's character and Gene Hackman's character was actually bringing back a lot of memories of um, of my time when I when um, when I worked for Major General Mike Jones. Um, yeah, an interesting dynamic there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, at this point in the film. Uh, Gene Hackman says, that's it. I've had it. I'm not sticking around another night I, I'm in the same spot. I'm going. And Danny Glover's bird dog character is like, no, you need to stay down. He's like, no, I'm on the move. And he starts speaking to him in his own self-referential code that he's, uh, he's basically uh, banking on the idea that Danny Glover will go back and relay this information and they will be able yep. to get in touch with people who will be able to say, okay, we understand what Ham is trying to tell you. So this is kind of the moment where he says, nope, I'm out. Bat 2-1 has a plan. I worked it out last night. Bird Dog would like to RTB, refuel, and confirm before you move. Negative. Bat's on the move. Heading for the Swanee. But I still don't know what the hell you're talking about. Bat 21 is teen off from the blue markers. Now, out. Uh, it's great for drama. Like it's yeah. great for the purposes of, of the film. And, um, and I love the fact that what I, what I appreciate about this is that even though in that moment, I was pretty certain that that probably didn't happen in the original event. I was like, at least the writers are trying to energize this rather than just the guy saying I'm headed for, I'm headed for our lives and I'll see you when I get there. You know, like they're trying to do something, which you know, give them a little uh, for that. So I will tell you, the real story of how, that sequence mm -hmm. was better than that. And oh, I don't know why they didn't go with that. I think because some of the, the words is kind of dated. But this is what happened. He didn't really come up with that plan. People back at home came up with that plan. Oh. Told the fact, um, guys, it was, I believe it was, I don't know if this was Joukowsky or Clark, but one of those two related to him and this so it wasn't clark because clark was actually shot down mm -hmm. so the, there's another fat guy who actually got shot down about a two kilometers from where um colonel hamilton was mm -hmm. so they told him something uh and they told him because he was from idaho go to the snake make like esther williams and float to boston which told him go to the river and swim east because he's from Idaho, he would understand that. So when they found out that Hamilton was a golfer, they told him, play 18 holes and you're going to get to the Swanee and make like Esther Williams and Charlie the Tuna round starts on number one at Tucson National. Hamilton's reply was, what have you been smoking? <laughs> and I'm like, that's way better. And if and in Hamilton's own words, it took him a half an hour before he figured out what they were trying to tell him to do. I wonder why they didn't do that. I, I, I've never heard of Gene Hackman. I, I don't know anything about Gene Hackman beyond the less you know about an actor, probably the better they are as a person. You know, but I don't see. I've never heard of Gene Hackman throwing his weight around. So I don't know. Would he be the type of guy in the writing room that would say? I don't want to be the guy who's having to figure it out. I want to be the guy that comes up with it. Like is I, that I don't know. I, I think the the term when they talk about Esther Williams and Charlie the Tuna, 
I think you would have lose a lot of your movie audience because I would have been like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> my mom and my dad may understand what's being said. Right. I would be clueless. So probably anybody who's 20 or 30 years old and younger would have no idea what's going on. Mm. That's, that's the only thing I could think of. Because sure. that to me sounded like a whole lot better and cooler than what they said. Yeah. <laughs> what have you been smoking? <laughs> so, there is a continuity, not gap. There's a continuity question mark right after this. Because the next scene is uh, Bird Dog Clark in the in the uh, office, not officers, but the, the airfield, the airstrip bar. He's, he's at the bar and, you know, the the soldier's mess, whatever, or club, whatever you want to call it. And he's there having a, having a beer and he's talking to his buddy. Who's another chopper. who's a chopper pilot who's playing bartender that night. And I just wanted to bring this up because I swear there's a deleted scene because Danny Glover is standing there with his palms, just bleeding profusely with a bloody rag on the bar. And there's no explanation for how this happened. Um, just check this out. Shit. I mean, you must realize they aren't always that active. You know, it's not a war story unless I screw up a video clip. <laughs> I put the watermark right over it. Right over it. Everybody. I, so, I, I think I know what you're talking about. If I remember correctly, he was working. There was a scene that was deleted, but I've seen it before because mm -hmm. there was something to do with his plane uh -huh. and the his mechanic couldn't work on it or something so he had to do it himself and no. he he was pulling a prop and he cut him's hand messing with his airplane i think i i, I want to say that you That's, might be right I, you know what i would i would love to find out that it was like i looked away to grab a package of fritos and then i looked back and it was like I, that that could happen um but uh but i would love to find out you know yeah. something simple like that uh and then we cut back to Gene Hackman. He's he's walking through the jungle. He comes across a small shanty that has rice on the on the stove and a clean a clean pail of water that he can drink from. And he decides, yeah, oh, go ahead, Tony. Go ahead, Tony. Um, have you got a clip? I do, but it's, but it's the, end. the clip's at the end, so it's the end of the encounter. So. So when I was watching this, um, as I often do with war stories, I do do a bit of research into the production of the film, but I always like to do that after I've watched it. So I sit down and, you know, um, so I can just experience the movie as the movie that it is and then go off. And um, and I didn't do a, a ton of research, but, you know, I learned, you know, that there's stuff that's not factually correct in this and right. it was heavily dramatised uh, as most true stories are when they when they get turned into movies but i was watching this part and i'm thinking i'm i know this guy's hungry i know this guy's thirsty you would never ever go in there you would not go into no no it just wouldn't happen <laughs> if, if, if there is food cooking that means there's somebody there right and and i don't know who or how many there are and and I don't know, but there's there's part of the real story that may kind of come into play in that, and we'll get to it later. But he Tony's correct. I'd be like, I'm really hungry, and they and that looks that mush that they have looks like a, a T bone steak right now. But I, I think I'm gonna get killed going up in there, so I'm just gonna. He, I was shocked that he had time. He got up in there. He could have taken the water pail and the bowl of rice and run back into the woods. That's what you should have yeah. done. If you're going to do it, that's what you should do. Yeah, I was like, why aren't you going back into the woods, Gene Hackman? Yeah. Like, what? Uh, unfortunately, then what occurs is the man who owns the shanty returns. He's a Vietnamese farmer-looking guy. He returns. He's visibly and understandably upset at what's going on. Gene Hackman's character of Lieutenant Colonel Ham knows some Vietnamese. He's trying to tell him that I'm not here to hurt you. He puts his gun away. Um and then the guy attacks him with a machete. He gets his leg cut, and then they're struggling, and this happens. Oh. 
So he's killed the man, and then right as that happens, the man's wife and two children come over the hill. They see that their father is dead. He tries to tell them he's sorry, and he goes running off as best he can because his leg is, is now messed up. Um, he gets to sort of like a very filthy water watery area, like a pond, and he tries to get out his first aid kit, give himself some um, antiseptic and things like that, and try and bandage his leg. Um, he's not having a great time. Not having a great time. So this is sort of true, mm-hmm. but he really? actually ran across a, a NVA soldier. Oh. And he pulled out his knife. Uh huh. And and stabbed the soldier. So there would be no noise. Yeah. There would be yes. So oh. my thoughts is, and I'm going to, being in the military, you develop a sick humor. So uh-huh. I try to stop that humor from coming. Uh-huh. But I'm just thinking if I was a professional soldier and a 53-year-old lieutenant colonel knifed me and killed me, and when you go see your maker, they're going to be like, really, dude? Really? You shouldn't even be here, but come on. What if- I'm assuming, but I don't know in the real story exactly how it happened. My assumption is he he may have surprised them and it was real the guy maybe not had a weapon out ready to go or something i, I don't know so because mm-hmm. to, to for him to have his knife out i don't think he would fight because a 20 something year old soldier from vietnam would probably outdo a 53 year old normally desk jockey right lieutenant colonel so i'm i'm not sure of the details but he did actually uh kill uh kill a soldier Mm-hmm. And he got hit, got delirious, and from his dehydration and lack of food, he actually got lost walking away and fell off a cliff and broke his arm. What? This is turning into a Will Ferrell movie. Um, <laughs> uh, we have a question here, and I, I would love to field this to both of you from Jesse Guardo. He says, uh, Michael, wouldn't stealing the food be a bad idea, especially if the enemy has dogs? Well, wouldn't survival dictate that you try and get what food and water you can regardless or? Yeah. But to a point, if you're going to die, if you are about to die, you got to eat. Mm-hmm. Um, the the dog thing, he was actually discovered by a kid and had their dog. Again, late they, com- they had to compact all these events into one. But later he did get and the troops were coming close to where he was. Um, but it wasn't to get food. It was just that he just turned the corner and there was a kid with a dog. So, but yeah, if, if you're hungry, hungry, where you are about to die, you, you have to eat. But other than that, you try your best to find other things to eat bugs and all that stuff. I know it doesn't sound tasty and they tell you, we, we go through the training. I'm sure Tony has been through the training and probably did way more than I did about the bugs. We had to skin animals. Um, capture our own animals, all of this stuff we had to do. And you're like, I'm not going to eat that. I told him, I said, I have, I have a food aversion. I, I, if I don't even know you, I'm not eating your food because this is rough on me. But uh, when you're hungry, they'll say, you'll eat it. So you just need to know how to eat and what to eat so that you don't wind up making yourself worse off. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, Clemens, there's a reason that I'm not scared of snakes, and it's because I've eaten a few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, the next the next moment here is uh, they are explaining to Bird Dog, Clark, how they're going to track Bat-21, and it's where they're unlocking his language code, and they explain the whole golf uh, bit here. Their objective carpet bomb this crossroads where Hamilton is and everything around it for eight kilometers. So he gives you an imaginary nine holes of golf. Well, when you lay those nine holes over our mouth, Captain, that's what they look like. Now we can track him. So he finds out that uh, the carpet bombing that's going to happen in that area to, uh, you know, take out the missile systems that the Viet Cong have in place is going to happen soon. And they've only been able to delay it 24 hours in order to get Lieutenant Colonel Ham out. And in the background, he's like, you need to study all these golf terms because he has laid out like three different courses that he plays 
to give us an idea of where he's going to be at any given time, mm -hmm. which is like, whoa, okay. Um, thoughts on that? Would that actually work, gentlemen? Because um, I was thinking, like, how do they know that the golf courses are lined up end to end? Yeah. Don't some golf courses kind of have different? Yeah, uh, yeah. Main... I think it, it was a little dramatic for the movie. If I'm not mistaken, it was like it was really only like one course. Uh -huh. And it was just the different holes of the course or something. I'm not 100% sure on, on that. But, yes, the Vietnamese were listening. They had English uh, mm -hmm. listeners. Hence why they said, you know, make like Esther Williams. They already use references. Right. So that they would – it's a culture thing. So that you wouldn't quite understand it if you're listening. Because mm -hmm. if you're not in the culture, you wouldn't know. But uh, that would be very – the longer you make and the more complicated you make a plan – it's going to be harder to do. So what is it, Tony? Mm -hmm. I don't know, do you have the KISS principle? Keep yeah, it keep simple, it simple, stupid. stupid. <laughs> it is the best time. You it, And I've seen it where you, people come up with this grandiose, we're going to we're gonna have this and you're going to support him with this and back here, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, why don't we just go over here and sit down and wait? And, and it, it is just, you, you got to keep it really simple on how you do things. So, And, and you got to think, what? this guy hasn't eaten a drink in days. So... Mm -hmm brain function is not going to be high. Mm -hmm. The first thing that went into my head when when they 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 lay down the, the the overlay there and they show all these different golf courses, the first thing that went through my head is moving through the jungle on foot is incredibly arduous. I, I've been in jungle so dense where um, a full day of patrolling, we've moved 800 metres. And oh, wow. You, you've been you've been on the march for for ten hours. It's that arduous. So I saw that and thought, okay, um, for for a man who you know doesn't have a lot of food, doesn't have a lot of water, <laughs> he's doing dog legs here, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's, it's like you're asking the guy to run a marathon with a busted up leg, and he's fifty three years old, and yeah. Yeah, I, I I can't imagine it would have been eight nine holes of golf or, yeah. or whatever. Right. Like Master Sun, one course would have made a lot more sense. Yeah. Well, speaking of, you know, one course and, you know, limping along and busted up, they tell him, we're going to finally rendezvous with you at this day and time, you know, here. And he gets to this spot. It's a big rice paddy, of course, between him and the frontage of this small village. And he tells them, he's like, hey, there's a village here. Like, you're going to land between me and this village? That doesn't... They're like, no, we're going to do some passes. So a big Jolly Green uh, helicopter and a Huey both show up, and then Bird Dog shows up in his plane. And the Huey and Bird Dog make some passes, and it's all quiet from the village. And they're like, ah, see, it's fine. We're going to come in. We're going to get you. So just wait till we land, and that's all good. Um, but the Viet Cong had some other plans. I thought you said that goddamn LZ was secure! Now get back in the tree, back to one. Back in the tree. I was getting emotional because I, I know it's coming up and, and it's the scenes where I have to turn it off mm -hmm. or, or mute it and not look, but could, I'm sorry, continue. Um, yeah. And um, remember how I said, um, remember how I said that um, StreamYard always does something stupid with me. So um, I'm going to need some patience for a moment because I'm going to have to go figure out why this scene which I edited, ain't here. Oh. So well, I can continue to talk. Okay. Because I, I will tell you about that pilot and, and who that actor plays. Okay. I'm going to mute my microphone so I don't disturb everything. So um, it'll just be me and Tony chilling and talking. Okay. War story kind of. Real war stories. No. Hey, so, well, I'll do you one better. <laughs> I'll be right back. All right. All right. So that guy was based off of uh, Captain Chapman. Captain Chapman was the helicopter pilot of Jolly Green 6-7. Okay. 
he was actually short. He was going home in two weeks. Imagine that number. Um, mm -hmm. He volunteered to go out and pick him up during this time. So he actually flew over. Uh, it was quiet. Then he got uh, Colonel Hamilton to pop smoke. And he did. And as soon as he popped smoke, they opened up on him. Um, the the helicopter that was almost immediately shot down. It was RPGs, guns, artillery, everything. Crew, entire crew crashed. They were all listed as MIA presumed killed. The uh, fact pilot overhead, I believe, was actually uh, um, Jakowski. Um, flew over and he was the one who called it and said, there's no way anybody survived off of that. Um, funny thing is they're, they're showing them dumping those mines in there. Yeah, They actually days earlier actually dropped mines on this edge to keep the soldiers from getting to Hamilton. But then they had to move him through the minefield. So when they did the, the golf course, it was actually the get around the mines that we actually laid there. So that kind of ah, interesting. So it's kind of kind of cool how they threw that little piece in there. Didn't yeah. happen that way because the, the I mean the helicopter instantly was uh, crashed and and burned right there. But yeah, I'm gonna have to rebuild this clip. If you want me to, sh I don't know what happened. It's not there. It's not in my folder. This is how War Stories works. I'm going to have to rebuild this clip. I can do it if you just give me some patience and we just got, what's that? We got to, as long as the audience doesn't just want to hear us continue, we can we can just ramble about stuff. Oh, I got dude, I have like four pages of notes for this great for the movie on this side All and right, the real story on this side. Because the temperature on my side is going up a little bit because it's like, oh my god, how did this happen? I'm going to I'm going to X out I'm going to get this clip rebuilt. I'm going to get it into the system, and then we're going to play it. So you you talk. You talk. Okay. Uh, by the way, well, Michael, I'm, I'm, going to, <laughs> I've got a question for you, Clemens. Yo. So I know all of these guys who who, who are coming in to, to, to try and rescue Hamilton, I know they're all hoping that they're going to be successful. Um, but a number of, a number of uh, personnel – get killed in the process of trying to extract this lieutenant colonel from behind enemy lines. At what point does the loss of life of other personnel get to a point where it outweighs the value of this individual? So funny you say that. That is actually things that were talked about. So they said after five days in numerous attempts to rescue Five aircraft were shot down. 16 were seriously damaged. 10 service members were killed or missing in action. Two of those were POWs and two were behind enemy lines waiting to be rescued. And so on April the 8th, the general ordered no more search and rescue attempts. Um, but because of his background of being the missile ear guy and his clearance, they, he just said, you, we have to find another way, but we can't we can't go in the air and get to you. Now, part of our training when we were doing all of our initial training is it's the whole thing about we're going to come and get you because it's a it's a big deal. If if the military does not come and get you and I'm a I'm another air crew member and I know that my buddy is not they're not even going to try to get him. That's a morale killer. Like you're already going in and risking your lives and, and over some, you know, stuff you may not exactly know exactly why. And, and for them to to say we're just not going to come get you is is really hard. Now, I also understand, and this was told to me actually by my uh, squadron commander when I was in Japan, and we would fly over the DMZ of Korea all the time. And honestly, he was like, you know, honestly, if something happens and, and say, you know, North Korea just decides they're going to attempt to shoot us down and we get shot down. And even if we got captured, they're not going to start a war over 
us more likely. Mm -hmm. Realistically, they, it's hard to start a war because you have a handful of people that they have captured. And because you know if you start a war, you're going to a whole bunch of people and get killed. It's, it's just, it's the nature of war. So I don't know what that point is. It's hard to say, like, specifically, it's going to be, it's not a hard thing. It's a, at some point, someone just has to call it and just say, we we just can't risk anymore. We just can't do it anymore. I mean, there, there, there are a number of different ways to answer that. It can be, you know, how do you personally feel? How would the military machine do it? Because there, there were points in this, so they, they never really, and I, I don't feel they needed to, but... They don't really explain what this top secret information mm -hmm. is that, that, that he's got. Um, parts of me were thinking, right, after so many failed attempts, if you if you keep making these attempts, you're obviously that desperate to get this guy out because of what he knows. Do you ever get to a point where you go, well, we don't want him falling into the enemy's hands So, because they had all these plans to, to, to do all the bombing? Let's just go ahead and do the bombing, knowing that knowing that he's there. But from um, from a from a special forces perspective, when we go through our um, particularly our resistance to interrogation training, um, all of the heroic stuff you see in movies, where you know guys get um, badly beaten when they're captured by the enemy, and they you know, but they never give up any information. It's all bullshit. Like you've got to be able to survive. Um, so, so we're, we're taught, we're taught about like s certain time frames, and that, um, within 12 hours of, um, a, a lot of, a lot of the time your unit, if, if you're behind enemy lines and you're captured by the enemy, your unit won't know straight away that you're captured. Mm -hmm. They were at the time, you know, missing. You could be assumed dead, assumed captured, whatever it is. As soon as though you get to that point of communications are lost, um, you've lost track of your behind the lines unit, you start changing all of your plans behind the scenes. Any kind of code words or, or mm -hmm. whatever that the guys might know, they'll be going through this process of changing all of that. Any planned operations or concurrent operations that are going on that people within that patrol may be privy to that knowing like okay well i know there's another patrol yeah, you yeah, know in, yeah. in this area or whatever all of that will start to change so that you know after 12 hours and then 24 hours and 36 hours if you are in captivity you can start opening up and yep. telling them yeah. whatever you want because it, it won't matter of course if this guy knows you know the location of secret <laughs> bases or whatever i don't know like you can't move bases yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, a, a, a part of me did think like, a, 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 surely at some point they're just going to go ahead and bomb this place, even though he's there. And, um, and it would be, it, it would honestly, it would get to the point of, <clears throat> and I would hope if I am on the ground for someone this, this, the, Hey dude, we can't do it. So we're going to continue with this, find you the deepest, dankest hole and crawl under it. And we'll try to we'll try to see after we you know the smoke clears, and, and, and see if we can we can come get you. And and you of course will be pissed off, like you will be yep. highly upset. And I say this not and, and I have a buddy with and switching to another movie, Black Hawk Down. I have a buddy who was a ranger who was in the Black Hawk Down, and he was one of the people who were left behind. And he still has a little bit right about here, a little bitterness about that, even though he understands why it happened. But when it happens to you, it's just you're just like, what? No, you need to try more. But um, yeah. in this in this actual thing, I guess after the helo crashed, the fat guys did tell Clark. And well, I keep saying Clark because Clark's in the movie. I don't want to get confused. The other person who's on the ground and Hamilton, hey, you just lost six people and, and their spirits dropped because they realized six people died trying to pick them up. Yeah. So uh, you you totally 
And sometimes I, I feel, I personally feel as if it would probably be like, hey, dude, we're coming to get you. Head this way and be out there and they may bomb it just to, you know, and, and take yeah, care yeah. of that. And, and, and that's the, the dirty part of war. That's the non-glory. That's the stuff that these young kids don't hear. And anytime I talk to like a high school kid or somebody who's talk, going to military, I will give them, I will give them everything. I will give them the dessert of how glorious and how the good things you can do, but I will give them their vegetables too and let them know yeah. it's not always what you see on these movies. It's a lot of hard stuff and it depends on what your job is. <laughs> do, you know, do, you, do, you know, do you know what I tell the young people who want to join the military? <laughs> Let's see. Join the Air Force because the Army. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, they, hey. They, they got they got the best food, the best uniforms, and lots of attractive women. <laughs> I, I will tell you, from coming from a military family, when I grew up, I was like at a point I said I want to be in the military, and these movies uh, kind of helped me decide what branch. And and I had seen stuff and heard, but I saw Platoon. And I remember watching Platoon and seeing the scene where he left left um, Devo, uh, William Defoe's character himself, yeah. and I was just like, "Army, check that out." Nope. <laughs> uh, I saw Full Metal Jacket, and when he said, "I," and again, Michael, this words, "I will gouge out your eyeballs and skull," you know, you. Yeah. I was like. That doesn't sound pleasant at all. Marines, you're out of there too. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I want to fly. And so I saw Top Gun and all that. And I was like, I'm going to go in the Navy and fly. Or and switch. I eventually wanted to switch into the Air Force, but yeah. Yeah. So uh, is, is Master Sun 42 your call sign? It is not. Um, actually, if you, uh, my call sign was 8 track. Because my initials were CD, and I was old school, <laughs> so my call sign was actually eight track. And your call sign, oh. your your nickname for your girlfriend at the time was cassette. <laughs> and you're wearing a Commodore sixty four t shirt. I am. Have, have either of you guys ever heard? When I was it, when I was a kid, I got really, really excited when my parents said to me, "We're getting a home computer," you know. And at the time, it was a, like Commodore Spectrum at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents are like, "We're getting the Commodore. We're getting the Commodore." So I went around school for like a week or two weeks, <laughs> telling everyone, "We're getting a Commodore sixty four. We're getting a Commodore sixty four. And we got a Commodore Plus four. Uh huh. I am are not you familiar, familiar with a Commodore Plus four? I am Plus not familiar 4? with a Plus four. Malaysia. It's like getting a Commodore 64 from Wish.com. <laughs> Melinda has a Melinda has a Commodore or something, something, and it's got a cassette deck loader. It, yep, that's yeah, the one. She still got the box and everything for it. Yeah. Wow. I had a cassette loader for my 64. You could buy the cassette, the data set. Yep. And plug it in and yeah. Yeah. Okay, so everybody, the way war stories works is I always screw up at least one clip. Hmm. And this time on for whatever reason, the one clip that I meticulously edited for Master Sun 42 because he requested it is, of course, what Murphy's Law says. Hey, guess what? Mysteriously, it ain't here. So I've recreated the clip. It's all here now. This starts from the moment they drop the mines oh. into the rice paddy to try and create a barrier so they can get Lieutenant Colonel Ham out. And then very rapidly shows you inexplicably and i don't know why we need to talk about this after the clip plays why did the guy piloting the the jolly green ignore orders to get out of there when they found out that the village was hot uh, he decided nope i'm going in there anyway and that's when he got hit by a rocket propelled grenade and then he had to come down and then everything went to crap so you're gonna see sort of a very this is how i edited it before so i didn't cut any corners this time but Here's the sequence of events, and it's not pretty. It's me they want. 
I'm gonna give myself up. Keep your ass down, back to one. Charlie doesn't bargain. Nothing you can do about it. They're walking him out into the minefield. Hey, come on. Like, first of all, I'm trying to figure out why. And again, I don't know. If, I thought maybe in the writing of the movie, they thought, well, we've got to show that a number of people gave their lives to get this guy out. And because we've compressed Danny Glover into three different people, we need to find another opportunity to show that sacrifice. And this is it. But it makes less sense to me because he's disobeying a direct order from his CO who's in the huge. So, how did that strike you guys, that scene? Oh, well, when I was a kid or when I'm up now? That's, however, that's... You'd like, however you'd like to feel the answer. All right. I'll, I'll talk about now. Um, from being a person who's in charge of other people inside your aircraft, mm -hmm. your responsibility is not to your own lives. It's to everybody else. Mm -hmm. So... And there is stories of, like we could go on and on, but the only way that I think that would happen is if he would have asked every single person that crew, do you think we should still go? And they all said yes, uh -huh. because that is, that right. is how you get a medal of honor. And that is also how you die. Right. Right. And get a lot of people killed. Sure. So that, that very thing is, is that, so that part, of it is what the conflict of what happened and and incidentally they took parts of that from the real story which mm -hmm. we'll talk probably talk at the end of when they actually did get uh rescued it was somebody not following orders who uh, did get them okay and they got a medal of honor for it oh wow yeah okay. when so we get to the end of the story i'll tell you the real yeah. ending of it and, and everything okay. somebody <laughs> got, got some real accolades for this this incident. Yeah. Okay, what do you what do you think, Tony? Well, so when so when you were off camera, Michael, uh, it, redoing this clip, I don't know if you could hear m myself and Clemens. Um, I asked Clemens a, a quite a mm -hmm. quite a powerful question about um, when I was watching this and you seeing you know after several failed attempts and they're losing aircraft and personally getting killed. At what point does the cost of this one man's life become too much? Mm -hmm. um, and that is a, a very, it, it, it's a moral quandary, which is one of the horrible parts of war when, you know, senior officers have to make these kind of decisions and go, you know, we're not going to make any more rescue attempts or, you know, we're just going to have to accept the fact that, you know, that SAS patrol behind enemy lines in Iraq, they're going to get captured and we're going to try and get them out after the war. Uh -huh. I know that, I know that reference. Gonna... Yeah. <laughs> um, so another thing that kind of entered my head watching this, because it was really sort of playing on my mind. I was like, surely at a certain point when, when we're that close to the end of the war and, um, you know, they had talked about, you know, this, this mass bombing campaign that they were going to do. At some point, they're just going to, go ahead with this bombing campaign, whether Lieutenant Colonel Iseel Hamilton's there or not. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I was thinking is this whole moral dilemma, that the, 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 the discussion it, that it's generating is what they tried to do in Saving Private Ryan mm -hmm. with a completely fictitious story. Right. If you, if you want to film that kind of, I suppose... When there are real stories out there like this, mm -hmm. why not make this? So right. I just have yeah. to take my moment to dog on saving private rights. <laughs> so glad that you said that because I hadn't made that connection, but you're absolutely right. Like, you know, I you know that I have no love lost for saving private Ryan, but I hadn't made the connection that this is a, this is a this is a legit analog to what they wanted to try and do. Yeah, run yeah. And, and just decided we're just going to make it up like it's poetry. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, yeah. I, that's one thing I do appreciate about this movie, even with its embellishments, the film never descends into poetry. Like it never gets 
lofty. It never becomes the thin red line. Yeah. Like it never, you know, it's just like, this is the story. Um, at this point, tensions are running high and, and people's emotions are understandably running high because they've just lost the entire crew of that helicopter uh, and they don't have their man either. Uh, and this occurs. I'm gonna waste this whole goddamn area. Bird dog, people are in the village. Repeat, civilians, women and children in the village. I can't say that I blame them for taking out what has become, you know, this encampment of, of hostility and everything. At the same time, the movie plays it as a moral dilemma, which is, you know, Gene Hackman's character has already accidentally or not accidentally. Gene Hackman's character has already, without wanting to, killed a local man. Um, he's uh, he, he didn't like seeing the carnage from the airstrike earlier in the film. And he knows there are civilians being used in there, like almost like human shields. And he's trying to tell the guy not to. So I get where Hollywood is kind of going with this. But in the case of what just occurred, is Gene Hackman's character justified in what he's saying? I think you are. You, you owe the duty to yeah. make sure it is known that there are civilians in the area. Right. And, and, and that, like I said, that whole scene is an emotional roller coaster. I mean, yeah. it is, you know, you see the first scene and you're, you're, oh my God, you're scared. They got hit. They got put down. Then the crew crashes. Now you're really worried about them. They shoot the, so, you know, the soldiers inside. Now you're getting pissed. Right. They make him go out there and step on a mine. You're more pissed. Right. Then they gun him down and kill him. Now you're at the height of piss. And mm -hmm. then Jerry Reed's character says, I'm blowing up everybody and you're going, mm, okay. <laughs> uh, I, and, and it's, it's, it's not the right answer. It's not the right feeling, right? But where the problem is we're this thing called humans. Yeah. And we have emotions and, and things happen. And technically that village is a threat. And now does the threat outweigh the casualties that you're going to go? And in his mind it does. And he takes out. And, and again, and, and, just for everybody on the policies in Vietnam and the policies now are, are a lot different. Mm -hmm. it, it is very much different. And we go through lengths to, to not have civilian casualties mm -hmm. to a point of, I have been there and seen, we got this guy locked. We, we're ready to, you know, we got a, a drone above him. We're going to smack him and he's moving and we're trying to get the permission and we know this is the guy. We got everything. We fill out the whole checklist of bad guy. And then he, there we get the get him. And then he goes into a building and they call it off because they don't know. Yeah, they like to hide in mosques, don't they, Clemens? They, they, they have done that. And and we just because can't we, we don't know who's in there. And you just our, can't do our, it. It's our rules side. of engagement. Uh, our, our, I'm sure it's the same for you guys. Our rules of engagement were doesn't even matter who's in the building or not. We weren't allowed to bomb mosques, so mm -hmm. the Taliban would love hiding in mosques. Yep. Uh, Keith Knight, uh, thank you for the kind super chat, sir. He says, as a teen, I nearly joined the Royal Navy, but chickened out and joined the Civvy Police instead. Did 20 years, but always wondered what if. Huge respect, guys, to my armed forces, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much. Thank for you, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Um, all right, so the next bit here is... Uh, they all go back to the airfield. They're feeling really ticked off, especially Danny Glover. His friends got killed. They still don't have their man. And uh, Jerry Reed says, his CEO says, well, we can't go back. Our hands are tied now because the airstrike is tomorrow. We can't do it. So Danny Glover decides, well, I think I'm going to do something else. He gets with his quirky mechanic. This air mechanic, this quirky Buddhist Zen type guy, but he's like a, you, you know, this, this 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 caricature of a uh, service personnel. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he says, you know what, I I did a little bit of helicopter training. My his plane got shot, so he, he limped back home, and now he can't fly his plane. 
not that he could land it to pick the guy up anyway. So he's like, I'm, I had a little bit of helicopter training. I'm just going to take the CO's helicopter. We'll see how that goes. We are not to go back in there until the strike is over. Yes, sir. So we have this again. It's that, that thing between Gene Hackman's character active in the story and giving him an arc where, while they're still trying to find the last ditch effort to get him out, Gene Hackman's character has a redemptive moment with some of the the native people of Vietnam, where he's passing a boy on a bridge. At first, the boy's worried when he sees him, but he makes no threat and moves, and the boy realizes he didn't try to hurt me at all. And then the boy realizes, oh, crap, there's this trap. I don't want this nice man to get killed. So he runs over, trips the trap, gives him his hat to keep him out of the rain. It's a nice little moment. And then it cuts to Danny Glover getting a cram course refresher and mm -hmm. how to buy a, a Huey. And then he takes off and goes after Lieutenant Colonel Ham. Um, at this point, uh, I know that you said, uh, Clemal, that uh, some people defied orders to go finally get this guy. What? How did that unspool? So, and by the way, you know how hard it is to fly a helicopter. Oh, I'm. Sh I could ask Melinda's dad. <laughs> I, I was on board a helicopter flying, and mm -hmm. the warrant officer is like, "You want to fly?" Like, yeah. I hop in, and he's like, "All right, we're gonna, you know, use it." No, and we were airborne. I was like. If he said to go left, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I couldn't do it. It's hard. So that was funny, Hollywood. But the story is, so after after the general basically said there's going to be no more air rescue, uh, they, they called down and there was a lieutenant who was a Navy SEAL mm -hmm. who was in Saigon. And he was, let's see, not, there was three Navy SEAL officers and nine enlisted in all of Vietnam. And he was awaiting orders to go back home, like out. Mm -hmm. And then he was told to rescue uh, Colonel Hamilton. Uh -huh. So he recruited five Vietnamese sea commandos, which is like their special forces equivalent. Right. And they all went down to uh, rescue them. So instead of the air thing, they actually went forward into a bunker and First, it was Clark, who was the other guy who was shot down. And when they told him to come into the water, um, so he started floating down and they went and got him. These orders were, you are not to go more than one kilometer from that bunker. Mm -hmm. uh, Norris said, F the orders, turned his radio off and proceeded at least double the triple the amount of distance uh, to get him. Um, so... Let me see. I don't want to make sure I get it right. So they were they were real close to him. Mm -hmm. He it was two in the morning. Norris could hear Clark breathing in the water. So uh -huh. he was just exhausted. And but there was a six man patrol. So like Norris is here. Uh, there's a six man patrol coming up the middle, and Clark is over here in the water. And so he couldn't tell him. Hey, we're over here because that patrol was coming. By the time the patrol left, Clark had already floated past him down in the water. Right. So then they had to turn around and go downstream and eventually got a hold of a radio. He, uh, Norris actually went by himself and swam for several hours, found him, and then brought him back to the bunker. And then they got him out of there. So, uh, they got that's how they got him out. So, but then it was, hey, we really, we really need to get Hamilton out. Why did they really, really need to get him out? Because that morning, the next morning, the fact pilots were flying over Hamilton and they said they saw him walk out into the open with a white flag waving it at the uh plane and basically said his mental and physical state was gone. He was uh -huh. losing it. 
he had he's been in there for 10 days and he's lost 40 pounds. Wow. So because the thing is, it's not that he's not eating, he's moving and right. not eating in right. the jungle, like Tony yeah. said. It's not walking down the street for a while. It's it's right. it takes you a long time. So when once he once uh they figured this out, uh the the bunker where they were staying kept getting attacked. So a couple of the sea commandos said, uh, uh, nope, peace out, I'm out, and they left. So on the 13th, Norris said, I'm going in by myself to go get him. And then one of the uh, sea commandos, uh, Petty Officer Keat, said, I'm going too. Mm-hmm. And then Norris blatantly told him, I don't think we're going to come back. And Keat said, I'm still going. So they actually got in disguises. Mm-hmm. Took a sandpan, which is like a, a boat, and went up river. And eventually, they found Hamilton in the bushes at the end, and he was delirious. Um, they went up to him. And they found out he'd only eaten four small ears of corn in twelve days. That was his whole meal. Wow! So they put him in the bottom of the sandpan, uh, covered him with bamboo, and went down the river. And he was like so delirious, he was like talking and stuff. And they came up on patrols and they had to like, you know, muffle his mouth mm-hmm. to get him to shut up because he was just, you know, you're, you're not thinking right. Right, right. Um, they were spotted by troops and in Vietnamese, the troops said, hey, come over here. And they were like, and they started <laughs> paddling even faster. And eventually the uh, they started shooting at him. So uh-huh. they were taking fire, paddling with the this guy down here, got on the radio and. Um, Talked to the Ford Air Controller, who had some uh, A4 Sky Raiders come in and uh, bomb the entire area behind them so they can get out. And then the uh, they also dumped smoke ah. so they can get out. Wow. So once they got back, uh, Lieutenant Norris was awarded the Medal of Honor um, for his actions. And then Petty Officer Keep was uh, given the Navy Cross which is the highest award they've ever given to a non-U.S. Uh, person for the Navy. Wow. Um, incidentally, a few years later, um, and this is one thing, if you ever heard about Lieutenant Norris, he's, he's got a good story himself. He's doing his mission and he's under fire and and does, you know, get, getting people out and stuff, gets hit in the face, shot in the face. I screwed up. All side of his face is jacked up. And the other Vietnamese like leave. And they're like, yep, he's dead. And they're out. And then another SEAL. Oh, man, I can't think of his name right now. But he basically goes, mm, let me go check on my buddy. That's my buddy. I'm going to get his body. Goes out, finds that he's barely alive, but alive. Uh, kills about seven or eight more people mm-hmm. and, and drags him out. And then that guy becomes the only Medal of Honor winner to ever save another Medal of Honor winner. Oh, so that, that would never actually that second guy got it first, and then um, then uh, uh, Lieutenant Norris got a Medal of Honor like a couple years later because I think Nixon gave it to the other guy, and I want to say Ford gave uh-huh. it to uh, to Norris. Wow. Um, and then later Norris was like, I want to go well, after he got out, he got because he got medically discharged because, you know, mm-hmm. the side of his face was blown off. And he said, I want to go in the FBI. And they were like, you can't go into the FBI because you are medically no way. And then I guess some dude high up knew the story of Norris and said, if you can pass the same test that my other guys can, uh, welcome to the force. And, and he, he became a like a 20 year FBI agent. Wow. Yeah, dude's, dude's hardcore. So that's that's how it really happened. Um, he was Hamilton was rescued when it was all said and done. He lost like a little bit over forty five pounds. Um, and one of his things in, while he was recovering in the hospital, one of his his statement was, "If the taxpayers and my neighbors knew what it cost to pull me out, they'd probably shoot me." Um, and and he fully understands the number of people who were killed just to, to rescue him. Uh-huh. And, and he, it, 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 it weighed on him. You yeah. can tell and there's, there's a couple of interviews. You can even see him on YouTube uh, of them interviewing him. And it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty neat to see that. 
Yeah. Well, this is how it played out in the movie, everyone. I'm so I'm so glad that we have that now in our minds to compare to because the one part you won't see that I didn't get a clip from is the very, very end bit where the Navy boat shows up on the river and they hop onto it. But the pastiche character of Danny Glover, whose name is Clark in the, in the film, this is how they get him shot down and with Lieutenant Colonel Ham for the, the last bit of the film. So he's just stolen the Huey helicopter. He's gotten over there. He's landed and Ham gets in, sort of. Let's go! Okay! strike has begun <laughs> trying to get out away from that as fast as they can it's a nice bit of, of hollywood compressing time and putting all that together and then they have this final conversation right before they look over and the boat has come by to find them there's this let this last little bit of dialogue between the two of them danny glover's wounded in the shoulder and gene hackman still has his bum leg you know, i've been in the service most of my adult life First time I ever saw any war. I want to be a fighter pilot since I was a kid. But they wouldn't let me out of the old two. It's lucky for me. You could have quit any time. Why'd you keep coming back? I guess it's the stubborn side of me. He's being told I can't do something. I love that exchange where he's like, I just hate being told I can't do something. <laughs> I love that because that that is part of why that guy ended up getting rescued in the real war to begin with. You know, people being don't like being told what they can't do. Um, so, Tony, the, the 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 film ends. You haven't. Just, I know you grew up with it more. I, I saw it one time. You grew up with it. Probably saw it a few more times. Um, what did you What did you think when the when the film was over? What were your thoughts? <clears throat> Well, just prior to that, that final exchange, um, when I was sitting down watching this two weeks ago, mm -hmm. that final exchange, I've, I've, and this is no uh, disservice to Danny Glover. I think he's a great actor. Mm -hmm. But I was like, what an amazing actor Gene Hackman is because he, he, he has played some horrendous villains. Mm -hmm. Like you think about his character in Unforgiven yeah. or, you know, the hard-nosed detective in The French Connection, Mississippi Burning. Yeah. But then here he equally pulls off that yeah. role of the guy who, you know, this is the first time I've seen any real war and, you know, it's, 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 it's so believable. Yeah, I, I, I got to the end of this film and was very much... It, this played on my mind for several days, and that to me is the mark of a really good movie. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what played on my mind is what uh, Master Sun 42 sort of touched on before was how this would have played on the mind of the individual mm -hmm. given the cost it took to get him out, the cost of human life, you know, the taxpayer's dollar, um, the, the changing of the... The, the strategy of the whole war in its final days. Um, yeah, and that's that's where I, I was starting to make these connections to Saving Private Ryan and going, you know, that that, that, that just put Saving Private Ryan even further down the dog pile. For me. <laughs> <laughs> what What about you, uh, Master Son? So the the I've never seen any war part. I'll, I'll speak on that for a second. For the first part of my career of flying i 100 percent feel that we would we were even after september 11th i went forward to a base in in um oman mm -hmm. so we took we were there there was no threat there we were it was we were intense and and stuff but it was inconvenient but there was no threat we were in danger 
we would fly two hours, two and a half hours, three hours to get to Afghanistan. So now we're orbiting Afghanistan. They didn't have anything that could really shoot us down per se. Mm -hmm. You know, lucky shots is lucky shots, but nothing that was a significant threat because we were like right over the date. We were like right there. Mm -hmm. um, the only time that uh, we felt threatened is flying and um, there was a guy who had climbed a mountain and was shooting at us. Um, not sure what it was. It probably was small arms fire. And I remember specifically at the time I was a, uh, a controller for aircraft and they had called and I went up there and I'm looking and uh, you could see the flashes and I'm like, what the fuck what is he doing? What? And they're like, we're getting shot at. And I'm like, Oh, oh shit! We're getting shot at. I'm like, oh god, hey, okay. Um, look, oh, and I put my shit together. I get on the radio. I call in some A10s. They smoke that whole area, you know. And it, and and you just don't. I land the next day. I go to sleep, eat, and rinse and repeat. Uh -huh. And it it's not until later when now I'm in a ground unit per se, and I'm doing kind of close air support stuff. And I'm on the ground now. Mm -hmm. And I'm on a base in Iraq. And we get mortared on a daily. Mm -hmm. Like, there are rounds coming in every day. The Sea Whiz, which is the, the gun that radar, and it sees the mortars coming in, it shoots it down. Those things go off all the time. And now you're like, huh, I'm a little closer, and it's a little bit more uncomfortable. Then, well, and I'm trying not to get too far on a tangent of war stories. I have to go to another location mm -hmm. and I have to convoy. And I'm like, mm, they shooting people out there. So now I'm in convoying with the army. And here, here's the story. Now, I, I think I told, uh, I, I told Tony this uh, before. So we're going and we pass this village we'll just call it a village and we take fire mm -hmm. like big you the rounds are bouncing off of the canopy and i'm with the army and, and this is gonna be a good story the army is like haul ass open up they're shooting back mm -hmm. at that position and we're hauling ass out of there so a couple of weeks go by and they're like hey dude we need to send you to the Marine base. Okay. I'm um, hoping I got a convoy. No, nope, we're going to fly you over there. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Where am I going? Uh, Fallujah. Um, Fallujah. That name's familiar. Isn't it the place on the news that they was just battling every day? And they're like, yep. And I'm like, oh, man. That's when I call, like, hey, mom, you know, I send up, you know, I'll get that cold phone call home. Hey, I'm going to be gone for a few days. Don't worry. Cause I normally would call her once a week. Mm -hmm. Just, just, you know, um, I leave, I fly over there and I get there and I'm in the base in Fallujah and it's been there. It's been there for a couple of days and we haven't gotten any mortars or nothing. And I'm just like, huh, it didn't dawn on me too much. So then we have to convoy to a location and I get on there and we pass a village. We take one bullet. One bullet. Bink. The entire convoy stops. They disembark. A lance corporal is told, take care of the captain, because I was a captain at the time. And they go up in there, and you hear shooting, yelling, all this stuff. The next thing I know, you see this guy bound behind him with zip ties, uh, thing on his head, and they take him open to the back of my Humvee. It's got a little hatch. Tony knows what I'm talking about in the back. Mm -hmm. They toss him back there, close it up, and I'm like, all right, so we're going back to base? And we're like, no, we're going to continue on our mission. Uh, he's being rotisserie style, marinated and tenderized back there, because we hitting bumps and everything. And I'm just like, oh my goodness. We get to the base and, and drop him off, do what we need to do, we come back. We come back, same village, same location, one shot again. Convoy stops. Marines get out. 
go up there. This time they come back with the dude and 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 guns and everything much faster. And when I talked to him, I said, what happened? He said, when we got up there this time, they were like, he's right here. It was that guy right there. He got weapons over here. He got weapons over here. Here's all <laughs> they didn't want no smoke. And they gave that dude up quick. And and I make fun of Marines all the time, eating crayons, all that stuff. And every time when I was in Okinawa, every time we would get in trouble, locked down, it's because the Marine did something stupid. And I would be like, Marines. But when this happened, I was like, Marines. I was like, from now on, I convoy with you guys. So that's just the difference of, of being flying and, and you're just so away from it. And then it's not until later, you know, towards the end of my career, where I really reflect and I go, I'm pretty sure I definitely got someone killed. And it started to weigh on me at the end of my career mm -hmm. of when I started thinking about, when I'm thinking about retirement, what I'm going to do after the military. And I start thinking about the guy in the hills, all the other people I called airstrikes on, all the positions I did, all that stuff, the other things I had to do were, I, you know, not not pleasant thoughts mm -hmm. and, and again i was nowhere near what tony was doing and let's let's make sure we get that clear mm -hmm. i was an air force guy who got shot at one time mm -hmm. where they looked at me right. and said i'm shooting at you right every other time it's been i'm shooting at an area mm -hmm. you got these guys in the marines the armies sas all these uh, they get shot on a daily out there. And, and so I'm definitely not trying to say I'm in that level, but when you come from where I was, where I'm thinking I'm going to hotels, I'm upset if my internet's not working. And now all of a sudden I am getting shot at in a convoy outside of Fallujah. And then come to find out they hadn't been shot anymore because after that fight in Fallujah, when they went through and they were just wrecking shop, no one shot at them no more. The Marine, yeah. the, their base was the most peaceful base of all, we're getting mortared every day. They get mortared once every two or three months. Right. It's just, it's just different mentalities and how you handle things. So that is, that's my. I know I took up the time in my war story, but that is like when I saw that scene, that immediately went into my head of how us spoiled flyers were so, we're so coddled, and we don't know. <laughs> we we're not in the real. You know, they say the chair of force, and I just go. All right, you know, I'm, I'm not going to fight you on it. Son, thanks for proving my point. As I mentioned earlier, to to the youth of today, if any of them come to me and and they're I, – I, I have a number of times in, in throughout my life been asked by parents to say, my kid, you know, either they want their kid to join the mm -hmm. military or, you know, the kid's thinking about – I want you to talk to them. And they all think I'm going to talk them into it. And the first thing I do is, you know, how, how, how serious are you about this? And if they're not 100%, they're like, don't even bother. Don't even bother. Uh, but, <clears throat> but the next thing is, um, join the Air Force. Don't join the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's been, a, and make sure no one knows, I am not in any way saying don't join. Neither me and Tony are, are saying don't join. There are a lot of benefits, and and yeah. I grew up so much between my my enlisted time and my officer time. I mean, the mass amount of growing up that I did was huge in like two or three years, compared to when I went back home and talked to my friends who are still getting drunk every night. Well, all right. An army Marines, never mind. Um, but anyway, other guys, <laughs> they're 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 doing the same thing. They're not doing anything adventurous. They haven't left our town. They're in the same town. They're doing the same job for 10, 15 years, and, and their experiences. And every time I come back, they want me to tell them all these stories. And being in the Air Force, I have like, you know, a handful of war stories, not really, really, really good. And most of mine are like, let me tell you how I showed this one officer up by doing him doing something stupid i got a bunch of those but it's if they want to hear all that and i'm just like all right i'll tell you but it's not really anything super deluxe like but they see movies 
Right. And and they see Bat 21, these really well thought out, well put together movies. Mm-hmm. And they and they see this and they understand they try to get this camaraderie and all these things and put it together. But there's a lot of other things that not so glorious that wouldn't make the cut of, of this movie. Right. Right. Um, Fantastics, thank you so much for the kind super chat. Uh, 999, thank you so much. Um, KBA says 20, uh, 24 7, not 247 years in a day of the uh, 47 years in a day of the United States Marine Corps. No, because it was the Marine's birthday, uh, just two days ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay, that's what I'm I sure thought, that's what he was talking about. I thought he was saying he was in the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Scuba Pete, thank you for the super chat. He says, love having Master Son aboard on this one. Much love, pal. Thanks, Scoob. And um, the last super chat I, uh, from your Muslim uncle, I think would be a nice way to end this. I know that Tony has a hard stop in a few minutes. Um, so I want to feel this is the last question of this episode of War Stories. Uh, it's from your Muslim uncle. And he says, for the panelists, what is your personal feeling on superior strategy versus honor humanity, even if different from military policy? See, that's that's a hard one mm-hmm. because a couple factors is a lot of times we don't know the whole story. Mm-hmm. You you hope that the your leaders know the picture, and while they're telling you to do this thing that you think is the dumbest thing ever, mm-hmm. and then sometimes you can be put in a vicarious situation where someone gives you an order, and that order goes against your moral judgment and Mm -hmm. your moral compass. And now if you disobey the order, you can get in trouble. Right. If you do the order, you can get in trouble. Right. And so they, they always say you're not supposed to do an unlawful order, but just because it's not unlawful doesn't mean it's not right. Mm -hmm. And, and there has been times um, and if we just did a straight up, we're going to tell you, uh, you know, my stories. I have a story where a officer basically told me to do something that I did not particularly care for. It wasn't like it was life and danger moral, but it was a unnecessary thing. It was going to cause my people that I'm responsible for unnecessary, you know, anguish. Mm-hmm. And I had to either figure out a way around it or I had to do it. And so I figured out a way around it. But that is a very hard question. And and you just hope that your leaders don't put you in that kind of a situation. And and for Tony, I think his answer is going to be similar. But his is more of the fact that it probably means his life was directly in danger by doing a certain task Mm. if i had to guess as much as um so so bat 21 is a far superior vietnam war film to platoon (laughs) (laughs) so what the one thing that which never came up in the platoon episode um is the tagline of that film the first casualty of war is innocence that's about the only (laughs) <laughs> good thing i think to to come out of, of that movie so i <clears throat> asking my personal feel on superior strategy versus humanity like this is what this is why war is so terrible because of the the morality challenging decisions that we are faced with and it's what plays on a military uh, man, woman, I don't just mean military men, but service personnel, it's what plays on their mind often for the rest of their lives. Um, so my personal feeling on it is that um, it's changed who I am. It's probably changed who Clemens is. And, um, and I think on Veterans Day, it's worthwhile recognising that it's probably changed the mental perspective of millions of our servicemen and women across the world. So again, I'm going to thank them for their service and, uh, and thank you, Michael, for, uh, 
organising this particular yes. episode. It's been an absolute pleasure listening to uh, Master Sun Forty Two. Um, you, you you messaged me a couple of weeks ago that you did a trial run. You said, "I have a feeling this is going to be a really good show," and <laughs> this has been a really good show. This yeah. is one of the shows I'm looking forward to going back and, and rewatching. Yeah. Um, I exit know. for eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Scott Hughes says uh, thank you Master Son and Tony for your service on this honored day thank you to all the veterans including my dad great show can't wait for more yeah. and um, uh, to, to Tony I just want to say real quick before we exit I've been seeing a lot in the chat here about people seeming to indicate that they would like to hear more from our good friend Master Son Oh. On this show. So, would you be would you be opposed to having a discussion about maybe making him somebody who comes back in the future? Absolutely, it would. Man, it would be a <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I didn't make a bumbling fool of myself. I'm no, that was glad eight. that was not happening. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for watching this uh, Remembrance slash Veterans Day uh, edition of War Stories for Bat 21. We will see you in two weeks, uh, uh, ostensibly with another movie. Do we know what movie that is, Tony? Uh, we we don't, but um, I'll figure it out. What do you have? A, do two you have weeks a time. It is Thanksgiving weekend. Um, I don't know if that affects. We don't have Thanksgiving here, so there's no effect on me. I just thought I would mention that in case you have something well, planned on the Friday of Thanksgiving weekend. But um, no, no. It's, since Thanksgiving falls on a Thursday every year, that's usually the only day I take up with it. See, mm -hmm. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know it falls. Why? <laughs> why a Thursday? That's, that's that, that, it is. It's the last, the last Thursday of every month, or something like that, or the third Thursday, or something weird. It's something weird like and that. And it's, 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 of course, it's a national holiday. So do they? Do, so do people what take Thursday off and then go back to work on Friday? A lot of people then try to take that extra day off because yep. yeah, it's like a so in the in the military, it's usually Thursday is your holiday and Friday is a family day, and they just you know you basically stay at home. You get a long yep. weekend, so. Um, George Aiken says, Master Son 42 tells some good stories. Put him in. <laughs> uh, there we go. <laughs> all right. Well, um, yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm fine, but I don't want to take anything away from you, Tony, or anybody else that does anything. Oh, no. Me. I'm, I'm, I'm 100% available, yep. um, in, in two okay. weeks' time. Yeah. Okay. So, well, let's, um, we, we, we've got a private chat going. We'll, um, we'll discuss options for the, for the next. I haven't even considered it, to be honest. Okay. Uh, the, the next movie. So, yeah. All right. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us, and we will see you on the next War Stories in a fortnight. Talk to you later. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.